Dara, thank you so much for being here. We're very, very pleased to have you. Happy to, happy to be here. Thank you very much. I do want to take some exception to that introduction. Yeah. Is that it hasn't just been about cleaning up messes. The asset and the business that the team built at Uber is extraordinary. Uh, and the talent level is extraordinary. I know the press likes to focus on the negative stuff. Uh, but it's an enormous opportunity. And uh, it has been a, an eventful year. Uh, but it's been great. I appreciate that, and we'll, we're going to have plenty of time to, to talk about those, those things. But let's start with the mess. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Let, First or, question. Or, or let, me, let, me, let me say it more nicely. Let, let's dispense with the mess as, as, as quickly as we can. The, the number one question that people ask me about Uber, or they ask me generally when asking about Uber, is do you think that a company's culture can change? Can a company's culture change once it's set? 100%. Okay, tell us why. Uh, 100%. Listen, it can change, uh, but it cannot change in a matter of months. So that can't happen. Um, cultures are not built overnight, uh, and certainly cultures are not changed overnight. And there are many, many elements of the Uber culture that were great. So I don't want to say that we have to change uh, everything. You know, this, this ability to execute at incredibly high speed um, and effectiveness, um, thinking like owners, uh, uh, making very big bets, uh, brave bets in big categories, those are all elements of the culture that I actually actively want to keep. Mm -hmm. But there are also elements of the culture uh, that hurt us. Um, this, there was a um, growth mentality uh, despite, you know, let's say uh, the 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 after effects of, of that of that growth, it was almost growth any at any cost. Um, and there are certain things that didn't um, match with with a culture that I'm trying to fix. That takes time. And I think if you see how we behave, not just what you say, you know, like what you say is one thing, but but what you do, how you behave as a company, how you conduct yourself, how you communicate, what responsibility you you take for your own actions. As a company, I can say that we are now acting in a way that is true to one of the norms, which is we do the right thing, period. Uh, we are not going to be perfect in every circumstance. But you've also seen um, that the partners, the cities in which we operate in, et cetera, are recognizing some of the work that we are doing, for example, in, in London. Yeah. Um, and, and the work is continuing. The work is not over. So if I could paraphrase the first part, your first part of your answer, th those positive attributes that you cited, those are part of the DNA of Uber, as are some of the negative attributes that, that you said. And, and you you're seem to be saying you can, um, you, you can celebrate and accentuate the positive aspects of the DNA, and you can, with the right approach, the right guidance, the right nurturing, you can excise the negative parts of the DNA. I, I think that the DNA over a period of time uh, can change, but it does take time, and you know it's not going to be a smooth path there. And, and the great thing is that when I talk to the employees of Uber, um, when I talk to the folks who are on the ground doing the work, um, they and we believe that we are a force for good. We, we democratize movement. We bring transportation to everybody in the cities, not just at the urban center, but at the outskirts as, uh, at the outskirts as well. Uh, and we are providing opportunity to millions of driver and courier partners on a global basis and, and building what I think is one of the most exciting businesses on earth at this point. Uh, and with that comes responsibility, and I think that slowly but surely we're stepping into those shoes in a more able way. And to be fair to your predecessor, the first part about what you just said isn't, isn't new. Those are the foundational elements of Uber, P providing opportunity, changing transportation. Yeah, I think, listen, the, 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 the day after I came in, when I talked to the employees of Uber, the, the picture of, I think one of the toughest things uh, was that the picture of the company that our employees had, as far as what they are doing on a daily basis, was radically different from what was being reported on in the press, et cetera. Now, now listen, it's not just what was reported on. Right? We have to take responsibility for, for what we're doing. I don't mean to say that it was only a press thing. Um, but the vast, vast majority of the people at Uber do want to do the right thing. They were looking for new leadership. Uh, and I think this is a journey that we're on, and, and I think it's going to take some time. But I look at where we are now versus where we were 
uh, when I came in and a couple of other senior folks came in, um, it's radically better. Uh, it's, and it, it's very, very different. Um, and it is building on a lot of good that have been done I, and I also making up for some not so good. On the question of time, you know, you, you, we'll, we're going to talk about your IPO at some point. You've been clear second half of 2019 is the goal. It's a goal, yeah. For when to do the IPO. When is the goal for the time when you'll be able to say, by and large, we fixed the culture of Uber? I think the culture work is never done. Never done. Listen, and, and listen, my, my goal isn't to fix. Like, I'm, I'm not okay. here to fix. I, I want to build um, a company with a team that will be looked at as one of the great companies in the world. If, if, if the only thing I'm doing is, is fixing, then, then I'm, not, I'm not doing what I came in here to do. There is some fixing, absolutely, but it's continuing work and we're never gonna be satisfied with where we are. And, and last bit on this, I, I promise. Should we view the abrupt departure of your HR head recently, the criticism about uh, your, your chief operating officer who you hired and this EEOC complaint that came up today, should we, should, it, would it be fair to say, uh, Need, needs to improve is still the grade that, that Uber gets on culture? <laughs> um, first of all, all of those were very, very different circumstances. I understand. Okay, the EEOC issue, while I can't talk uh, much about it, has been going on for a long period of time and happened to show up in the press at this point. So what I don't want people to, to read into is there are much deeper stories behind the stories that you're reading. Um, I don't like the fact that they're showing up in the press the way that they're showing up. Uh, I had an all hands with my team at Uber uh, this morning and I was like thinking about what I'm gonna talk to the company about and, and I was planning to come in and kinda um, you know, complain about the leaks, how could this happen, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as I thought about it, you know, the, the, what's coming out in the news is a symptom. Uh, and, and it's a symptom for us of a company that doesn't yet, at all levels, at all levels, really, really trust um, that we're going to do the right thing, not only externally, but also internally. And, and listen, there's been a lot of folks externally for us, and, and we've made great, great strides externally. But the first thing I've got to look at is inside myself and inside our teams, and I think if I look at myself self-critically and my team self-critically is that because of everything going on, we took on all the external challenges and I think we've done really, really well under the circumstances externally. Um, and in hindsight, I didn't work as much as I had to internally. Mm. Uh, and you know, sometimes, I said this morning, sometimes it takes a punch in the face to see things clearly. Um, this was one of the moments for me, this was a rough week, uh, but it is incredibly motivating. I think we absolutely have the tools. Uh, and you know, I'm the one person who has to stand behind what happened. I don't like what happened. Um, I'm not blaming it on the folks who, who were responsible for the leaks. I take sole responsibility. Okay. Uh, and I hope that next year when we're here, um, it'll be a much, much better story. I'm sorry to go Washington Press Corps on you, but is Barney Harford's job safe? He's um, the chief operating officer, but by the way. Yeah, so there were accusations, uh, allegations made there. Um, we are, we take very seriously anything having to do with, with anyone, but especially our senior officers. Senior officers, we're not gonna run a process through the press, we're gonna run a process the right way, and what I can tell you is that the process will be run the right way. Okay, not a no and not a, not a yes. It's too soon. Understood. Too soon. Uh, totally fair. Yeah. You, um, you, you describe Uber as a, as a platform for, for public transit. You, you've used the expression, the Amazon of transportation. Tell everybody what you, what you mean by that. What's the, big, what's the big vision for Uber? Well, listen, what we're looking to build at Uber is um, essentially your A to B platform for anyone wanting to get from one place within a urban destination to, to another place. Uh, and, and what I talked to, to some folks about is, you know, um, cars are to us what books were to Amazon. Just like Amazon was able to build this extraordinary infrastructure first on the back of books and they went into additional categories, you're gonna see the same thing coming from Uber and that category number one was actually black cars and then uh, the team went and executed beautifully behind UberX and brought in a number of other categories. 
We're now uh, a new category, relatively new for us, is eats, which is delivery, which is growing at extraordinary rates and is, and is a huge, huge opportunity for us. It's interesting what you said. Eats is food delivery, right? Yes. But People on things. Yeah, okay. People on things. Uh -huh. People on things uh, uh, from point A to B. Uh, and now what you see with uh, e-bikes and you see with scooters, et cetera, I know that it's, it's all over the news, et cetera, but I actually think that there's, this is just the beginning. This is just the beginning of new technology that with battery technology and, and contract manufacturing scale that you're seeing on a global basis, I think you're gonna see extraordinary innovation around personal transportation in urban destinations. I think so. Uh, we've invested in e-bikes and we partner with Lime on scooters, et cetera, and, and, and other bikes. And we're going to look to work with uh, the transportation providers in, in the cities. We want to have the bus system show up on Uber. We want to have a metro system show up on Uber. It is going to be real time. You're going to have real data. The, the, the payment system is, is going to be um, incredibly easy with, with one touch. Uh, and eventually, over a period of time, we can bring in other technology into these traditional segments of transportation if uh, it's appropriate, like dynamic pricing or dynamic supply or dynamic routing. Um, so we think that we can bring so much to bear. And so far, we've done it on only one mode of transportation. We want to bring it in every single mode of transportation on an urban basis, and then the better magic actually is if we link it all together so that you can always as an individual make the trade-off between time, convenience, privacy, and cost, mm. whether you want to go pool or whether you want to go uh, alone or whether you want to go black. We will give those choices to you and you'll, and you'll make that determination one way or the other. And, and is it true that you're interested in working with taxis again? Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. Why? Because it's, it's an A to B product. You know, and, and I think that um, there is a place in the world for taxis, and especially in markets like Japan, et cetera. It is a very strong industry. It's a huge market for us. Uh, and if there's a, an entity, a unit, and whether that's a driver uh, partner who signs up with us directly, or it's a fleet owner, or if it's taxis who want to have access to the incremental demand that we, that, that we bring, we're game for that. You know, this is not, the, the great thing about this business is, um, if there's one thing to fear us, uh, I believe it's actually not taxis, although I realize we've been very competitive, et cetera, it's car ownership. Huh. Uh, and when you look at our business, and for example, Lyft together in the US, we are responsible for significantly less than 1% of miles driven in, uh, in the US. So as the cost per mile comes down, as we invest in technologies like pool, where we bring more than one person into cars, we may uh, test with high occupancy vehicles, et cetera, the cost per mile for transportation is gonna keep coming down. The cost of car, car ownership, I don't uh, believe is gonna uh, keep coming down because of various aspects there. And we will become more and more competitive with car ownership across a broader swath of cities. That's where we're going. And if that happens, you know, we'll go from 0.5%, hopefully, to 20, 30%, which is, you know, a huge multiplier of this business. I really believe we're just getting started here. Yeah, we have so much ground to cover, and I'm determined that the audience has, it has a lot of questions to ask you, too. Um, before you go do an IPO, you need a CFO. Are you having trouble finding a CFO? Uh, we are running a process that's taking longer than I like. Um, but also part of the process is to make sure that we are as broad as possible in terms of finding the right candidates. Uh, and I'm being picky here. I want a great, great CFO to lead this company uh, into the IPO and beyond. And we have some terrific candidates that we're looking at at this point. How um, is it important for Uber to make money? You lost uh, about <laughs> $4.5 billion last year, $2 billion if you take out some costs. I know you have a, you have a, you have a, you have a, a, a thought around this. Explain it. Um, yes. <laughs> but no, listen, in, 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 okay, in I'll the, ask it more end, specifically. In, in do, end, do you need to make money before going public? Is, is the I question. don't think necessarily before going public, but you need to demonstrate a very clear road to profitability. Um, the most important factor for me is cash, first of all, and cash flow generation. Right? The, the, the thing I want to, I believe capital allocation over a long period of time is an incredibly important 
kind of skill for any management team. Um, and I don't want to be dependent on private, public, or any markets to fund the business expansion and the extraordinary expansion in front of us. So I look at cash before profits, but over a period of time, it is absolutely important for the business to be profitable. And when you look at the microeconomics of various cities in which we compete, um, various areas in which we compete, actually the profitability of those parts of the business look very good as we go into new markets, as we, for example, launch new cities for Eats, for example, or as we invest in e-bikes, those are not going to be profitable uh, in the near term. Um, but as long as we can demonstrate profitable unit economics, compelling unit economics and growth and a huge market, uh, I think we can go public without being a gap, uh, let's say, a net and composite of a company. And is it necessary for Uber to own its own self-driving car technology? I think that we believe that during this phase of commercialization in the very, very early days, uh, we have a structural advantage in having under the same roof uh, a team that is working on building this self-driving technology because um, building self-driving for any case whatsoever in the world I think is enormously challenging. By the way, I think we'll get there. We but being Uber or the industry? The, the industry. Listen, this, th this is ultimately about making, uh, you know, saving the lives of a million people who, who die from car crashes uh, in the world, saving billions yep. of hours and, and billions in costs, et cetera. So I think this is a real industry thing, but listen, we're competing within this industry as well. But we need to build self-driving technology that, and we can commercialize self-driving te uh, technology within a limited bounds of our demand within a city, yep. uh, and we can commercialize it in a way that no one else can commercialize. And I do believe that in the early development of self-driving technology is very important for us to guarantee access to that technology. We will be completely open, however, to working with other self-driving technology partners. So it is not going to be exclusive in any way, shape, or form, and we are huh. totally open for business with other players, and we're having active discussions with other players. What I'm also hearing you say is that X years from now, when this technology inevitably becomes commoditized, you might be just as happy buying it or leasing it from somebody else. I think it's something that we'll, we'll certainly look at. It. I do think that we will not be a single source provider of self-driving technology. We are or the yourself. core business. Yeah we're, yeah, we're a network business. It doesn't make sense to be single node on a network. Very interesting. Please raise your hand. A question for Dara. Uh, we have mic handlers. You're going to have to have a mic to ask your question. Okay, right there, Jason. Please, uh, even though I just said your name, please stand up and say your name. Hi, guys. Jason Rapp from Whisper Advisors. Hey, Dara. Hi. Uh, so I'm a Santa Monica uh, resident, and we're kind of overwhelmed, I think, in a wonderfully positive way by the scooters. <laughs> Bird Scooters is a local for us. You just invested in Lime. Um, and I think it could you know, totally transform that last mile. Tell me a little bit more about the investment in Lime, how you think about scooters, and maybe how you stack rank Scooters versus Eats versus maybe international expansion, I don't know. It's tough for me to stack rank, although I, I would agree with you, it's, it's, it's a huge opportunity. And, and I think when you step back, um, half the world's population lives in urban centers. That's gonna go to two thirds of the world's population and that is an extraordinary opportunity, right? Um, but no city wants more cars. You know, cities are not gonna be able to come up with the infrastructure required to satisfied demand of all these cars. And if you are traveling, let's say, three miles or less, for you to, as a single occupant, take a car and travel those three miles is a very inefficient use of assets and is a very inefficient use of the roads of any city. So when we look at e-bikes and we look at scooters, and I think there will be many, many other versions of it, mm. um, travel within two to three miles within cities for individuals or two people I believe is gonna radically change over the next five to 10 years, and I believe it should radically change, and it's a much, much better use of assets uh, than a car to take you all over the place. We haven't had real innovation around you know, personal transportation in cities for the, or for the past 34 years. This is the first time I'm really seeing it, and we wanna play a part both as a platform and as, a, as kind of a vertical player as well. But 
if we can bring this and we can work with multiple players to do it, we absolutely will. Over here, please. Hey, Dara, Mark Mahaney. Uh, over the last year or two, there's been some divestments of geographic areas. How do you feel about the geographic footprint now? Are there other areas that you're considering cutting out of, and are there new areas you could expand into? Yeah, I think um, I love our geographic footprint right now. Part of, um, we wanted to be in the geographies that we thought that we could win in, uh, and I believe that we are now, um, we have a scope, uh, and basically every geography that, that we're in, uh, we can win over a long period of time. So India is a key market for us. Uh, the Middle East is a key market for us. Africa is a key market for us. And, and I don't think at this point we're spread too thin. So we can not only win those markets, but we can make bets on new technologies like scooters, e-bikes, et cetera. We can be offensive and aggressive uh, in this giant marketplace of ours. But, but Uber assured China and Southeast Asia and Russia of it that the, they were in, in for the long haul. How can you convince these other geographies that you're not going to pull out of those geographies. I'm not going to spend a lot of time convincing. I'm going to spend a lot of time doing. Very good. Uh, over there, please. Yeah, this is uh, Bonnie Simi from JetBlue Ventures. Uh, about a year before you joined, Uber started down the path of Uber Elevate, Uber for Air, if yeah. you will. And now that you've kind of gotten your arms around the company, I'm curious about uh, your focus in that area and, and how much you plan to uh, build that out. This is flying taxis, yeah, right? Uh, this is exactly flying taxis. We continue to invest in and be very excited in the Elevate platform. And it goes to what I was talking about previously, which is cities are simply not going to be able to come up, uh, are, are not going to be able to keep up with the infrastructure requirements uh, for transportation in two dimensions. And just as commercial buildings went three dimensions and residential buildings went three dimensions, we think there's a third dimension needed in transportation within cities. And we think that Elevate with battery technology and, and with fly-by-wire technology is a technology that is going to be able to be commercial within five to 10 years. We want to make sure that it's commercial in a scale, mass market way, which is why we're working with partners to make sure that the designs are not designs that are specific to you know, only the wealthy, but are designs that can really reach a broad, broad array of, of people who live in a city. Is developing this expensive? Have you spent a lot of money on Elevate? Uh, we have spent a lot of money on Elevate, but we are not developing the vehicles ourselves. So we're partnering with a number of people, and, and you know, I'd say most of the balance sheet investment going in is, is coming from the vehicle designers and ultimately the manufacturer of the vehicles. Last question over there, please. Hey there, Jason from Comparably, doing a great job. Thank you. You talked about uh, other categories you're getting into. So Eats, are you going to be competing with Postmates for delivery of all items? What other categories are you going to get into? Uh, we're actively looking into other categories. But I'll tell you right now that the Eats opportunity is so enormous that we are really focused on getting your Eats delivery right every single time. The team is fairly monomaniacal about that. So I hesitate. Anytime you try to do another thing, it takes focus from the thing. And right now, what we see at Eats is so much growth ahead of us that I'm encouraging the team to stay focused. Dara, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.